The following program is brought to you by the Zero DB Movie Podcast Feed. Now, you listen to me. I don't want any plastic. I don't want any ground floors. And I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. And you're... And you're... Uh, George, George, George. Good evening, Zero DB Movie Podcast listeners, and welcome to Episode 3 of After Dark, our after-hours movie podcast that we do after our little monster goes to sleep. I am your humble host, Gabe Aniel, and with me is the second half of the we in this After Dark podcast. That is my co-host and lovely wife, Claudia. Good evening. Good evening. How are you feeling tonight? I'm okay, getting over a cold. A little under the weather, a little coffee, coffee. A little bit, a little bit. It's all right. We'll, we'll uh, you know, we'll get through this. We'll have a good time. Um, we'll have a couple laughs and a couple coughs. <laughs> yeah. And we'll sure. be, we'll be just fine. Um, so there's a reason why we're doing this episode and the movie that we're doing. It's December, and apparently, from what I've been reading. <laughs> December is the month that, like, all the TV shows are slowly going on holiday hiatus, if they haven't already. Um, So then you got, like, several weeks of, like, holiday specials, reruns, annual broadcasts of, like, The Sound of Music, and It's a Wonderful Life. And before you know it, it's 2018. Correct. And you're like, wow, okay. But today, we are discussing a movie that we are both newbies with, and I feel stands the test of time. I mean... We're going to discuss this hate-free, like we try to do it at all of these. There's critiques, there's all that stuff, but like there's no reason to hate, you know, like, oh yeah, like uh, inconsistency with uh, his bow tie or something, you know, that's just hate. Um, Like I like to use the words theater of the mind, Um, that's what we go for here and have a good time with it. So the movie is not The Sound of Music. (laughs) Too bad, I love The Sound of Music too. It's Frank Capra's 1946, It's a Wonderful Life. Yay. Yay, Christmas. Um, I feel that Wonderful Life, it's like one of those films that feels like it's always on during the holidays, and you feel like you know the film, and it seems like you've seen it a bunch, but when you think about it, and you come to realize that you've never seen this film from the beginning to the (laughs) end, you're just like, wow, I don't think I actually sat down and really, really watched this. Um, Directed by Frank Capra, obviously. Uh, it stars James Stewart, Donna Reed, Lionel Barrymore. Those were like the headline names of the time. Um, Capra was known for things that I'm not that familiar with, you know, just by names again. Like, who knows if I even watch these. But, like, it happened one night, 1934. Mr. Deeds goes to town, 1936. And Mr. Smith goes to Washington, 1939, which is the one I think I know the, the best. Like, that's the one, like, I'm as mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. Right, right, I think right. That one, right? I think so. <laughs> um, but this film, It's a Wonderful Life, was actually considered a kind of a box office flop when it played in theaters in 1946. We're talking about a movie from 1946 and 2017. And I know. I, it couldn't have been that big it, of a it, flop. It's, yeah, right? And I still think it's it's a you know a, a good movie. Um, I had to write this in. I got to quote this because it was kind of interesting because I was wondering, like, why did we start seeing it so much, at right. least as kids and all that, like, And apparently, and I quote, due to a clerical error at NTA's copyright office, the copyright wasn't renewed when it expired in 1974. The film became public domain, meaning anyone could obtain a print and could broadcast it without paying royalties. Local stations aired it dozens of times between Thanksgiving and Christmas Day, and in the 1990s, after a series of court battles, NTA's successor, Republic Pictures, reacquired the rights to the film because they owned the source material, the greatest gift, which was which was the short story, um, 
that the movie was based off of, and they also owned the score. So whatever, it got copyrighted, NBC now owns it, and now they play it. Right, right. So now it belongs to NBC. But I mean, like, that's kind of cool, because it was kind of like set free. Right. And like, all the stations were like, hey, let's just play this. It's filler. It's right. free. We don't have to do anything about it. And next thing you know, everyone's like, yo. It's like they watch amazing. it enough that they like it. Yeah. Yeah. And it just becomes like a tradition, you know? Right. Um, you were a true newbie to this, right? I remember you telling me that you've never seen it. Right. This is um, my first time seeing it. So we saw it together. Do you remember at least like pieces of the film back in the day? Or were, like, were you just aware of the film but never gave it a chance? Um, sure. I mean, What's I... your little back history with it? I definitely never saw it before, but I know I've seen the iconic scene like where he's hugging his children and like kissing his wife after he realizes that life is definitely worth living. And, the, you know, the, the bell ringing, the angel getting his wings. Um, A lot so, of, ah, uh, ah, Mary. So I, I definitely remember that uh, probably just from seeing TV characters watch it on their home screens, like for mm-hmm. Christmas. Like mm-hmm. it was like, oh, the season has started and it's a wonderful life is on. And so in a way it's like this, I don't know, what would you call that? Like a meta experience where the film I never saw is like the Always on and everything anchor, else you watch. Yeah, of everything that I watch that is like a shorthand for it's time to celebrate the holidays, you know. So um, I don't know. I was. It's not like I was reluctant to watch it. I just never watched it. It never came on any channel I actually watched. Maybe it used to come on cable. When I was little, we didn't have cable. I'm sure it came on like no. 9 or 13. Like the oh, yeah, who watched public that? Public access. <laughs> not public access, but you know what I mean, like those, right. those channels. Yeah, I never, I never watched it. I think more um, my traditional holiday christmas uh movie would be um any version of um the christmas carol so scrooge you know the mickey mouse one when i was really little um the older ones the the whatever versions that have come out over the years so those were like your traditions like watching that stuff that was like the christmas um, movie for me which was just whatever version of a christmas carol Oh. You know, now, yeah, yeah, now yeah. it's a wonderful life. I right. knew of it's a wonderful life, but I didn't ever watch it. Yeah, for me, it was always the that was the other movie because mm-hmm. we would always watch Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. That's true. That was so that would be like, oh my god, it's on. We gotta watch it. We gotta <laughs> right. watch it. You know, like and you watch it. Right, right. Um, I don't know why. Never saw It's a Wonderful Life. It just kind of felt like that other movie. Yeah, yeah. Um. But I'm glad I did watch it. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, it's not really a Christmas movie, except that at the end, it's Christmas time. But the whole movie is not about Christmas. It's about. So, would you say this is one of those movies that takes place during Christmas, but it's not a Christmas movie? Probably. I mean, the sentiment is there that you, you know, I mean, it's definitely not religious, right? There's no religious really component other than the angel. Um,. But it's not like they say, the movie starts baby with, Jesus. No, but the, they are. everyone does pray. Everyone's praying for George. Oh, you're right. And at the end, he's praying That's right. on the bridge. And That's he's right. like, oh, yeah, God. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to live. Um, no. Apparently, there was something, another ending that was like, Capra said it was way too religious. And he was like, no, 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 no. Let's do this, right. you know. Right. So I think they were they got a little religiousy without wanting to, and they right. were aware of it, and they kind of took some stuff back. Yeah, I guess maybe I was. Whereas um, Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street is like the whole film is about Christmas, proving the spirit of Christmas right. in the court of law. Right, and then for a Christmas Carol, I mean, it all takes place Christmas Eve going into Christmas Day. So, right, those are Christmas movies. Yes, and yeah, this interesting. Movie, I didn't look at it that way. I just thought of it. And this movie is more like, here's the story of this man and what his life has become. And it's Christmas time and he's going to have a Christmas miracle and realize how important life really is, you know, which is fine. Right, because he sees what his life would have been like without him. Right. Which um, brings me to the tagline, which kind of annoyed me. Um, 
the tagline is, an angel is sent from heaven to help a desperately frustrated businessman by showing him what life would have been like if he had never existed. Cool. Kind of gives you the gist of it, but I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, it's like a simplified movie poster tagline that I feel does the movie no justice at all. It's like, it's so much more, especially since like the angel doesn't even come until like the second or third act of the movie. Definitely, yeah. So I feel like when I've talked to people about this movie, they're like, hey, it's Wonder of Life. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, the guy's on the bridge. He's going to jump, right? And then, like, you know, he, like, sees his life flash before him. And you're like, yeah, that's what I always thought it was. Right. But it really isn't. No. It's I like know. you have 75% of a movie mm-hmm. before you get to what everyone thinks is, right. like, right. what the movie's about. Right. right. Which is pretty crazy. Right. Um, I mean, overall, I mean... I know you have notes about things about this movie, um, but overall, like I want to say that I really like this film. Um, the message you get from it, the life lesson, the sentiment, Capra loves sentiment. It even says it in that uh, documentary we were right. watching about it. Yeah. He's a very sentimental director. Very sentimental. They actually call it a Capricorn. Mm-hmm. Um, but like in general, like I wrote down like sentiment and how it truly makes you believe in humanity a little or at least... <laughs> At least the film is until the film's over. Um, I love the sets, and the soundtrack, and like the overall flow of the movie. It does have this thing where, like, like I said, I put it, I, I put it in, watched it for the first time, and I was just right. like, oh my god, like this is, wow, this is a great film. Like I right. don't have to be like, all right, now I got to sit all through through the boring beginning parts until right. you get to the bridge. Right. It's like no, there's a real film here. It's like real characters. Some of the side characters are not like you know. As great as you want them to be, but they're kind of there to support the story of like George right. growing up anyway. So it's right. kind of like, yeah, 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 I get it. That right. guy is just thrown in there, and now he's kind of like just cool. Um, I would give it an eight point five out of ten, and I don't rate movies, right? But like that's like a solid B plus, right? And I'll tell you later why it's a B plus and not anything higher, right? Because it's fun. But um, like, what about you? Like what? You don't have to give me, like, this is not, like, on the record kind of thing with a 1 to 10 scale, but, like, right. you know, before we get into it, like, an overall... I think I give it, like, a B. Okay. Like, an 8 out of 10 or a... Yeah, or 7.5. Which is, like, a C plus. Really? Yeah, oh. 70 is a C, oh, right? Oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. All right, all right. Then, no, a B. So, like, an 8. <laughs> okay. Because um, I think you're right. I don't... I definitely was expecting the the twist or like the part of the story where he starts to see his life or what the world would have been like without him much earlier in the film. Definitely felt, you're right, it wasn't boring, but it definitely was like, this is a movie about this guy that's like taking a while. And it was fine. It was lovely when he falls in love with his wife and everything is funny. Carries my, I mean, it was kind of silly that everybody looked like they were 40 years old and they were supposed to be 15 and 16 it's years It's Hollywood. Old. Hollywood, classic golden age of Hollywood, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it, it definitely, I was like, wow, there's a lot more to this movie than than I thought, you know? Um, so there was that. And then I remember that we, in the documentary we we watched, they said that um, that there were three different scripts for, like, the adaptation of... Um, the Greatest Gift, which was the short story. The original story short story, that, which got bought by RKO for right, 10 grand. Right. And then um, they had several writers try to hash out a script. And then there were three scripts that Capra selected to, you know, work on. And he decided to make his own script based on those three scripts. And, I mean, I do, I feel like that's part of what was going on here. I mean, it's like three different stories. I feel like it, it's it's like the coming of age story with George from when he's very little to when he gets to the point where he's about to jump off a bridge. Then you have like the melodrama of like how unhappy he was, you know, at that point and like the drama of his constantly being let down. His town and like his his role in the town and his father's business and all of like the trials and tribulations they faced. Um, and then there's the fantasy story, which is the angel that's, you know, trying, has his own agenda, which is to get his wings finally. 
and like the magic that takes place. He's been waiting, what, 200 years? Yeah. Yeah. He, the magic that takes place with him, you know, coming to earth to get this job done. So that's like a separate story. That's like the Christmas story. But then you have these other two stories that are all in there. And, um, I, I mean, I, I don't really know much of Capra and Jimmy Stewart's work other than I know for Capra, I saw it happened one night with, um, I think it was Cary Grant and, um, Claudette. What was, I don't remember her name, but, um, it's a famous film and it was very good and it was very spunky and funny and, um, also kind of, you know, just very entertaining from beginning to end. And then with Jimmy Stewart, the only other movie really that I've seen of his is uh, Rear Window, which is Alfred Hitchcock. And he's one of my favorites. So, of course, I'm going to love it. Um, but I, I knew just from their names that they... Claudette Colbert. Claudette Colbert, right. Um, and I, I know that the two of them are just upheld as like American, all American types. You know, like he was all American filmmaker that makes classic American films and Jimmy Stewart's like the all American guy everybody likes the guy next door that that has strong convictions and you know represents um the greatest parts of America so just knowing those two things going into the movie like I knew that it was going to be that kind of sort of patriotic kind of you know story that's supposed to show the fabric of the country, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which is also a little disappointing because <laughs> the fabric of the country was very whitewashed, which is fine. I mean, it's 1946, so right. what are you going to do? But at the same time, I was like, you know, in watching the film for the first time as an adult living in our times, I'm like, whoa, you know, like this is the nostalgic film everybody's talking about. And I accept it. And it's weird because I never lived that life. Never even came close to it, but I still think, oh yeah, that's what America was like. Right the um, the mix of cast of characters for yeah. them, a good mix was like you know like, man, the rough bartender, <laughs> and then yeah like you know like the the old drunk pharmacist. Right. Well, he got drunk as his son died. I know, but like said. you know you have like the kooky cab driver, Bern Ernie, the the cop. You know like yeah. So it's not like the sassy like black servant lady right and the like who's in their business and, yeah. and like you know he george lets her know it all the time and like totally sexually harasses her too <laughs> well it was yeah it was lovingly but like i know what you mean <laughs> <laughs> i know but you know it was just it's funny because it, it, for having watched it the first time ever i i just poke at it with this stuff because it's so present in our current reality that it kind of you know, um, just you just can't help but notice what um, in other eras was just accepted and and upheld and just you know that was that's the story of our lives kind of thing you know. So there was that, and then um, I was surprised to find out that um, it it didn't do so well when it first came out. I know you mentioned that it was kind of a flop, but. I was surprised by that just because it's so well known now and like has been for so my entire lifetime that it, it's since 1974 when yeah. that copyright was yeah. was up. So it's just odd to me that it wouldn't have done well. I mean, the the documentary we watched kind of explained a couple of things. Like right. the weather was bad. The weather was terrible. Like it was a storm. People were like it was people, freezing out. People thought it was kind of a downer right apparently you know. there was another movie that came out that kind of overshadowed it overshadowed, overshadowed it. it yeah and uh i do not remember what it is right now I don't but it was kind of like it came out like the weekend before so people were kind of like yeah we kind of went out to the movies and saw that big premiere yeah. so now hey, it's cold out we're not going out yeah and who knows maybe people didn't really go out for christmas like you know they stayed home to celebrate but i don't know right and then the movie was kind of considered a little dark right so, and it was. I mean, there was a lot of melodrama. That's yeah, one of my, that was um, crazy. One of my negatives too. It's like a little thick, you know. But but overall, it was it was fine. And I mean, the romantic parts, I think, kind of balance it out. You know, like the scene with right the him first and, kiss. Oh, one of the best lead ups to a kiss in cinema 
ever. I was watching and I was like, this scene is super racy. Like I can't. Yeah, apparently the censors made them crop the shot up higher Mm because there was too many too many like arms around their bodies (laughs) that seemed too racy. Um, Also, that was his first kissing scene since he's come back from the war in real life. Right, right. right. And he was really rusty and he was like very insecure. Uh huh. So like, so he didn't want to do it. He wanted to do other stuff first. So apparently, Capra invented the scene with the phone where they both had to be at the phone right. together. You can really feel that tension. And it's a real tension. And it's really good. Yeah. It really which is good. really well done. And I love the like like the mom at the stairs. She's freaking out because <laughs> she wants her daughter to date the uh the other guy. <laughs> the rich guy. The rich guy, basically. Yeah. Um what were some like of your your other memorable moments of the movie that you liked? Um well uh, I mean, like a specific um, stuff that pops out, like the kiss well, was a big one for the you. Kiss, well, I love the the scene in the in the high school when they're the dancing dance, and then they the open dance the, contest and they fall in know, the pool. They, I mean, I did once once that happened, that scene happened. I, I did pick up a theme where like water is big um, is a big uh, um, sort of defining thing for George Bailey as a character because you know in the very first opening scenes we see him save his little brother from an Drowning icy in the pond. pond and then we see him plunge into a swimming pool with who will later be his wife and he falls in love with her and then in the end there's he the jumps threat in of, to the river to save oh, correct. Clarence he saves Clarence from the river and instead of, and he's, instead of committing suicide right and he's threatening to jump so you know there was something kind of thematic there that i was like okay this you know something about the idea of water and like i don't know plunging into the unknown or you know um, uncharted territories where dangerous. the whole movie he wanted to Travel the he world. Wanted to be a, he wanted to and go see on new places and experience things he's never experienced before. Right, right. And but he ends up staying where he was out of um, commitment, out of. Uh, but at first, I don't feel like it's commitment for him. I feel like it's him putting himself last. Well, I think when he first sees home after his dad dies. It's because he sees the threat of everything his father. He doesn't want Potter to take over. Right, built to. It's like the uh, the memory of his father and all his work and all the people he's helped. He doesn't want to see that. Right, get so destroyed. he puts that first in front of him. Right, right, and then. Um, but I don't think he sees it as a sacrifice in that moment. I think he. Well, he also sees it as temporary because his brother is supposed to come yeah. back. Everything and take That's over. That's the whole tragedy of it is he thinks everything's temporary it's well like, now well, he, i'll just do this well i'll just do that Mary's mary he doesn't i think he knows that that's definitely yeah but he also yells at her saying i don't want to be married well that was it that was at the phone scene yeah i'm like what a conversation to have before we first kiss right 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 he just basically yells everything that he doesn't want right which he really does want because that's what happens afterwards right right so very Typical of the dating experience. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 just kidding. Um, so yes, yeah, so the dance hall was wonderful. I thought that um, the town in general, um, the sets that were constructed. I mean, I know we have uh, two, two contradictory um, um, tidbits on that because I found uh, something that said that the sets had actually been built already for. A prior film and used several times um and and you said that you read the set was built exclusively for right and that documentary also showed all those workers building the homes yeah in in the the section that i found it did say that i mean he built more buildings mm-hmm. but that like the four acre set was like already there built. was something that's there. what yeah that's like what basic i read structure is the rko lot had this it Big, was an RKO lot, yes. Yeah, huge yeah. thing already gotcha. built, but then he, they built more. Like, he brought those 20 oak trees, planted them. Which is pretty badass. Yeah. So I, f- I found that the town itself was a character, and, um, you know, we really see it grow up with George, and it, like, takes over the screen in so many scenes, like, especially those big... Um, like broad out 
outside outdoors scenes where they're just walking, you know, from here to there. Right. And, um, in town, and it just really it was really four comes acres alive. of RKO's Encino Ranch, right? And um, so I thought that 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 was really um, quite a um, an achievement to sort of create that um, living place, you know, that right. very bustling kind of living. And I I read that they let um, dogs and cats roam free to oh, sort of make it yeah, feel like yeah and what were you telling in. me about uh it was modeled after seneca falls oh, right yes yeah. so seneca falls in new york in the finger lakes region um is the town that uh frank capra sort of used as a model for bedford falls and in seneca falls they have a festival every year <laughs> for oh, it's a wonderful great. life yeah because they like are proud of the fact that they were you know the the model. Seneca of, Falls. Um, so um, so that was that was cool. But I, I I also I mean I liked the other characters. I mean some of them just felt a little bit um, one dimensional. Like Uncle Billy, I thought was, I mean he was funny and he had that great moment that we saw, right in the documentary where. <laughs> Uncle Billy walks off set, and there's a giant crash, okay. and that's an actual prop person. Knocking over a whole ton of props, and the actor who played Uncle Billy was smart enough, professional enough to say, "I'm all right. Yeah, I'm all right." Take advantage of the mistake. And you see George kind of chuckling, right? Which right. works for both ways, you know. There's right. a lot of cool stuff, and apparently Frank Capra gave that kid like a ten dollar bonus right. for adding sound effects to the movie. Yeah, and then in the scene where um they're in the bank or at the business and loan um you know when the crash is happening, I guess, and like the the place is running out of money, and all the um, clients come in and they want their money right away, and he's trying to convince them, and then finally, Mary like says, "I have the two thousand dollars from our vacation, your know, honeymoon vacation money," and they oh. start giving it away, and um, and Frank Capra told the very last actress who was going to say how much money she wanted to surprise him. It was supposed to be seventeen. Dollars. No, it was supposed to be 20. Because everybody had been saying 20, 20, right. 20. He was like, just surprise him. Surprise him. Just say whatever. And she says 17, 50. And he kissed her. And he kissed her. And he was just like, oh, you know, like he was so excited that she um, she needed less. So, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, Frank Capra built a lot of those moments. Um, he's obviously a master at that, you know, sort of um, coming up with like these little human moments between characters to, to show the relationships that are built in the town. Um, the kid actors were great. I know you and I both were like, that's Young a good George. looking kid. Though. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like the two little sassy girls. <laughs> <laughs> Mary. She's I mean, where were these girls? Mothers. Right? She's like, um, I'll have the chocolate or whatever the ice cream was. Is and this your bad ear? Is it, oh. I'm going to love you forever. <sighs> That was so sweet. <laughs> that was really the sweetest. I know. Just moments like that really make the movie um, come alive and, and stick with you, you know, and make you feel like you're part of this place. Memory in this memory, you this know, memory, like it's, yeah. it's almost like him. It's him. It's not him telling you his story, but you're being told his life story. Right. So you're kind of there with him. Right. You know? And then there, there are moments that are like reminiscent of your own life. I mean, that's why I'm saying, like, when you have, like, the three stories, there's that coming-of-age story, which is very um, developed, you know? when you, Whenever you watch a, a coming-of-age movie, what makes it good is when you f see yourself as a kid in it, you know? Like, you right. feel like you're reliving some part of your youth. And in this movie, that really happens. Because you see this kid, he's, you know, when he helps his Mr. Gower... And he like the does, pharmacist. Oh, you know, I was so he sad. He runs all over town to try to save him and like talk to his dad, and he couldn't. And then there's that moment. I mean, it was awful because it's child abuse because he broke his ear. Basically, apparently in real but, life he hit him for real, and they said that there was blood in his ear for real. Oof! And that the older man actor was just like, "Oh my god, I am so sorry!" <laughs> like because they both got in. They got for real. They got real for real. Oh, and that actor. Like just a tidbit side side note, he played Jesus of Nazareth yes. in an earlier movie. It was yes. like his only other movie, really. Really funny. But um, 
yeah, so, you know, you have that very developed part of the story, which makes you feel like you know this person, you've known this person since he was a child, and he's been a good person since he was a child. Right. Always looking out to do the right thing, no matter what it cost him, you know? So I thought that was really good. I wanted to... um I want to jump into a couple of critiques yeah. right now. Um, I'll start off with mine and why I gave it an 8.5. Okay. And that's, um, that's Uncle Billy. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uncle Billy annoys the crap out of me <laughs> because the whole movie he even has, he, he misses George's wedding. I know. So, like, for instance, like, George is like, you can take that string off your finger now. Like, the guy is riddled with strings on his finger to remember. Mm-hmm. Why would George entrust him with depositing the money, especially $8,000? Like, that's not the guy you give it to. Right. That's not the guy you give it to. So, like, and, and not only that, that could be, like, you know, you can somehow counsel that. But the fact that, like, he never had to, quote, unquote, pay for it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I mean, I think that his, there's definitely that. Like, they never got to the bottom of it. Right, that's annoying, and that was very annoying to me. That, um, but I saw it more as Uncle Billy didn't get absolved because he did pay for it. Because um, George goes to him and yells at him. Yeah, when he grabs him. Yeah, and he basically tells him, "You're a loser," and he's left crying. That's true. It was really yeah, that's sad. true. That is sad. And um, so at the end. When I'm like, but he didn't lose the money. Okay, he did lose the money because he put it in the thing and he gave. But it wasn't like that was a, a substantial thickness of money <laughs> to <laughs> to realize you don't have any more. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, no, Uncle Billy was definitely a problematic character. I I was annoyed that he was such a mess from beginning to end. Right, and I get it. If your Uncle Billy's a mess, let him be a mess. You don't let him handle the money. Right, but he's also. He also started the business with his dad. That's true. So there's a respect thing and an elders thing and Yeah. I mean, right. there's a hole in the story with Uncle Billy. I mean, he I I think he could It's have, fun to pick on Uncle Billy. Yeah, he could have done a uh, I mean meaning Capra, I think could have done a better job of of developing that character just a little bit because it, it was a little like, okay. Right. But I mean, other than that, I mean Mr. Potter was problematic for me too. He well, he was he was a typical Scrooge. I know, but ugh. I know he was definitely the the character actor of playing a Scrooge. You I know. know, like you just gotta be like he might as well have just been saying "bah humbug" the whole time. And he played he was played by Lionel Barrymore, right? And I terribly was like, "Oh my God, Drew Barrymore looks, looks like, like him." him. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awful because he's just an old man, poor Drew Barrymore. Right, and when I try to think back. Of what the guy looks like in the movie, I just think of the penguin. Yes, yes, he did look like the penguin. And you know what else I read? I read that um, that there had been another scene in the beginning that Frank Capra decided against. Thank God. But in that scene, when um, George is saving his little brother, so before he falls into there, it, they're setting up that they're on Mister Potter's property, and Mister Potter sees them. And is mad about it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm so glad he didn't do that because I was already kind of like, really? You've had this one foe your entire career and then it was going to turn into your entire life, which is like, okay, it's a little bit much, you know? I know that he never left the town, but I mean, you really, the one nemesis is this old, disgruntled, lonely man. It's just... Like they could have made. He owned him everything. Baby. He was buying up the town, Potter's Field. I know, but he could have. Well, there could have been something a little bit more human about him. Of course, he was like the Monopoly Man. You know, especially the penguin. Since, especially since George's character was so empathetic and so, you know, forgiving. I think it could it would have fit to show Mister Potter somehow being um, remorseful or right. explaining why he is the way he is because we've, we're have we watching this film where this man is like us, right? And and he's a forgiving person. So we could have had some kind of change with Mr. Potter, but instead he just 
was a jerk from beginning to end. So we need a prequel movie about Mr. Potter <laughs> and how we became that. <laughs> Mr. Potter. Or like the next, or like a sequel would be right. like Ebenezer Scrooge. I thought Mary was also a little problematic for me. I mean, nothing against Donna Reed. She was perfect. I mean, the first scene when they show her, I mean, the character we'd already seen as a child, but when they show her that close up, I think we both were like, whoa. Like, she's gorgeous. Yeah. She was perfect. And I think that's what bothers me about her because she's just an oversimplification of women. Like, she's just everything he needs and nothing else. She's just, she's fierce. She's committed. She's gorgeous. She's, um, um, you know, thoughtful. And um, she has four children and looks like a model. <laughs> and, you know, so it's a little, like, all right. I know she's ideal, but it, it was a little much. But still, um, I thought Donna Reed did a great job because she really embodied, like, that sort of all-American girl Right. Apparently, there was a lot more famous people in line right. for that role. Right. And uh, I think Capra wanted her, right? Yeah. Yeah. They went to a different studio of her. And I thought she did a great job um, holding her own with Jimmy Stewart, who's, you know, a scene hog. And she, she in that scene with that phone, she was just as like electric as he was. Like, oh, yeah. They were perfect. She was, and it, it looked real. She was driving him crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I like, I think you found that tidbit about um, how they had hired someone to help in that scene with the. When she throws the rock at the house, that eventually right. becomes. They had, um, there was two stories I heard. They had someone on set ready to throw a rock in case she missed. And mm-hmm. there was another guy apparently with like a gun, like a little mm-hmm. rifle thing that you mm-hmm. can like snap and hit the window. Right. But she was a baseball player. Right. <laughs> And she hit the window. That's her she's hitting the awesome. window in the movie when you hear it crash. Yeah, yeah. She's and great. like, and I think that was ad lib when Stewart was like, "Nice shot." <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say, even though it's really sappy, I mean, it was really sweet that they like. She had his friends put those posters all over the house for they the didn't get to go away. Yeah, on their uh, honeymoon. Yeah. I because mean, they gave was... all the money away, the two thousand dollars. So romantic. It was really sweet with I the know. house that she wanted, that she wished for when she broke that window. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was sweet. I mean, that is one thing she did get what she wanted in terms of the house. Um, that scene where he comes home annoyed. Remember, he because of the eight thousand dollars he's missing, and he just gets crazy with everybody in the house, and he's just like breaking everything and burp, 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 screaming at the kids. Finally, snaps. Right. It was like so dramatic. Like that's the melodrama that I was like, all right, we can scale it back a little bit. But I mean, he was so good, <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. Right, right. And you kind of hear it though, like if you put yourself in those times where like Potter was just like, you know, I'm gonna call the police right. and this is this, and like it was different. Like nowadays, you misplace eight thousand dollars, you claim bankruptcy, and you're good. Right, right. Wow. Then it was probably like I'm. I might rot in jail right. because of this mistake. Right. You know, like. And he had the weight of like everybody losing everything around him. Right, which is... and when Potter was like a complete jerk, mm-hmm. and like realized he was just like, oh wait, you lost the eight thousand dollars, knowing clearly that he didn't, because mm-hmm. he would have been like, you know, oh you stupid man, it was your drunk uncle who took it. Here's the money you right. owe me. Now you should sign with me if you want your money back. Right. But instead, he didn't. He kept it back and just tried to like go the other route, which I guess was a lot more meaner. Um, who, Mister Potter? Yeah, when he was just like, "You're you're worth more dead than alive." Oh, right, with the life insurance. The life insurance. That was weird. And then he's like carrying the life insurance policy in his pocket. Like, if he jumped in the river, they wouldn't pay that out, right? Like, if he... as long as the ink didn't run. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah. So there was that, and then I I had in my notes too that um. That it was funny because they did, you know, he he helped the community, and one of the main characters that they showed him helping was the Italian immigrant family that had been victim of Potter's slum. Right. Martini. Well, Martini, yeah, um, had been a victim of uh, Potter's slum lord techniques, and finally got a chance to have a home. And then, of course, they like show the wife and like the twenty five kids and like whatever. So I was like, well, I'm including immigrants in the American story, so that's good. Well, Frank Capra was born in Sicily. Oh, that's right. 
that's right. So um, so that was that was cool. And then he obviously is instrumental at the end in getting people to help, or he's one of the people that right. comes to help him right. in his hour of need. So that was cool, um, like returning the favor. And then um, I guess um, we can get into the part where uh, Clarence makes an appearance finally. I mean, he did the voiceover in the beginning, but he's comes on stage. Pretty much what, act three? Yeah. Act three, now George is ready to jump. Mm-hmm. You're worth more dead than you are alive. Right. Puts the life insurance <laughs> in, in his, his jacket. Jacket pocket. Goes to the bridge. Yep. Crashes, crashes the car, car into the tree. Mm-hmm. Gets out. Guy yells at him for messing up a tree. I wish that would happen these days. Right. <laughs> Goes to the bridge. He's about to jump and Clarence jumps in himself. Right. And George becomes George again by saving this guy and not thinking about himself again. Right. Um... Yeah, that happens at the end. Yeah. And he shows up and then they have that funny scene, which is almost like a little Twilight Zone scene at the garage, like at the gas station. Where no, it's like the clubhouse of like the bridge guy who opens oh, and closes oh, the okay. bridge or whatever. So like the, the bridge keeper sitting in there with them yeah. too and he's while they're drying their clothes and stuff. <laughs> like if that was ever in that movie, I'd want to play that guy. Right. Because he was so funny. Just like... What are these two talking about? Like he was so. And he had the comic really like the physical comedy he falls yeah. back in his chair yeah. and he's just he like whoa. Like, he was, it was just such an odd little character to throw in there, but also like a great way to comment on how, you know, because we were talking. Is about, this really happening? Yeah, like it's like we're we're talking about how this film is sort of in parts, and now we've come to this fantasy part that it's like how does it fit in with everything else we've just seen. And I thought the use of that character and the incredulity of or, like his expressions of surprise and like being like, what is going on here is perfect because it bridges the like real realism that we've been seeing with like this fantasy element. Right. You know? so, George is even kind of like, I don't know <laughs> what's going on. Are you seeing this? The guy's like, I'm seeing this. Right. So it's kind of like. It's funny. Yeah, because it's if good. that third person wasn't there, people might be like, wait, is this a dream sequence? Right, exactly. Is this really happening? Exactly. And it was just I a guess smart that guy way. sitting there represents reality. Right. It was a smart way to sort of bridge everything together. Um, and um, and then, of course, he makes the wish and Clarence is like, great, that's what we'll do. We'll show you how. Right. And there I feel like it turns into like a Christmas carol yeah, type definitely. thing, right? Because it's definitely. like ghost of Christmas past, mm-hmm. kind of. Yeah. If you were never around, this is what it'd be like. Right, right. And then of course everything is horrible and his brother died and so all the, the soldiers he saved died. Right. And like um Potter bought the whole town and Mary was just like a lonely librarian. I feel like they really over explain it back in those days. Mm-hmm. Cause like, you know, George is just like, No, what do you mean you didn't save those people? And then he, like he's just like, well, because he didn't, you didn't save him in the bomb. He died. He and, didn't go to the war, yeah. so he didn't save those people. Right. You know, like yeah. he's like every time very, very perplexed. Like, well, what do you mean they don't know me? Right. Well, that was part of his character all along, or at least Jimmy Stewart's performance was very like like I, the bubble above the head. Yeah. Thinking like, stuff throughout, like he just kind of had this like um, mannerism that I told you reminded me of. Jeff Goldblum, even like in because we just saw Thor Ragnarok, and he had that sort of sensibility where like he's almost talking to himself. You almost start with a little stutter, like a question, almost British. Yeah, but like he's talking to himself, but he's talking to you. Kind of, it was weird. I don't know if that's just an overall Jimmy Stewart mannerism, or if it's we might not know enough Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to look at some of his other films to to decide that. But but yeah, I mean, he they definitely do. you know, hammer the nail on the head there with the, <laughs> over oh, and over this again. Is definitely, what it's gonna be like if you if you're not alive, right? You know, but it's effective because like to in prove the- to him that his brother died, they have to show him the gravestone, uh, <laughs> and he's got to wipe it off on the bottom and be like, "No, that can't be." Speaking of, now that you mentioned that, um, it's I guess it's worth mentioning that that they did they came up with a new technique. To make snow for this film. Right. Back in the day, they used to use 
painted corn cornflakes. But it crunched. Cool. And you had to overdub all the vocals. But Capra didn't want crunch. that because he wanted a realism to it. Right. So, so he, they invented snow, which yeah. eventually got them an Academy Award. Mm-hmm. And they also brought in like shit tons of, yeah. of different fake snows to right. like thousands of pounds of this and this and yeah. the other and the other. Very cool to to to, sh- to check but out. But I think it's important because it because all that snow is on this pe- pivotal night, pivotal moment in his life where he's deciding whether he wants to go on. And so I think it was appropriate to have um, to go the extra mile to make sure he could get the proper emotions and the dialogue. And right, the, create this world for real. I yeah. mean, Capra was known to like do stuff where apparently in another movie, it was a much smaller set. Where they were able to build the set inside of like a giant freezer right. type thing, and that way they had the actors had the breath. Yes, so yes. So he would he go to, to these that. extreme measures for back then. Right. Big budget film type guy, you know. Yeah, like, for sure. You got a Richard Donner. He he type definitely. Thing going on. He I'd read um, and I could see through this film, which he considers his best work too, or he considered his best work and favorite work. Um, that he pays attention to detail, like he definitely. Um, goes the extra mile to get that shot he wants, to get that feeling he wants to convey. Um, and it's effective because it, you know, you see that snow falling. Um, it's very thick. It's very um, oh, yeah. overwhelming. Right. And Uncontrollable. And that's the emotional turmoil he's going through. You know, that's why he loses control of his car and like, you know, everything else. So it's very effective. Um, and then he, what is it finally that makes him realize he wants to live? Is it when Mary is afraid of him? Remember, he's like, I'm your husband. And she's like, oh, everybody's trying to keep him away. And Oh, right. Because she's like a lonely, like, what do they call her? <laughs> yeah, but they call her some. Um, uh, School marm or. Uh, yeah, something that seems a little like not cool to call uh, her that. Like a spinster? No, not like a miser, but like a, not like an old hag, but like pretty much saying like. She's become an old hag because she didn't get married and she's a librarian <laughs> kind of thing. Maybe a spinster. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because now he's yelling at her with a crowd around him. He's like, Mary, it's me. It's me. <laughs> You're just loving your, your Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> you know, we should redo this entire interview with you doing Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> oh, no. No. No, no. You're good at it. Um. Yeah, I mean, like, so there's not a lot of critiques. I mean, like, you can go through IMDb and, like, people do some Haiti stuff. Yeah, you know, sure. like, just stuff where it's just like, well, at one scene, they're standing here, and then the next scene, they're standing there. It's like, yeah, I know, I get it. But also, the versions we're watching now was not the released theatrical version. Because right, right. there's things that they took out that they weren't allowed to do. Certain words, certain right, scenes. Right, they got That kind of stuff. But you watch it now, and it's in there. Is that why, remember we were watching that one scene and I was like, why is it editing? It was like these jump cuts. I think it was with Mr. Potter. Yeah, I think they put back either edits or scenes that was not in the movie originally or something like that. Yeah, it was like a weird just jump cut, a couple of jump cuts that have, and you're like, oh, that's weird. Um, It didn't didn't seem like it was specific, like it was meant to be that way. Um, What else? How can we... uh, we can wrap it up by saying that. I mean, overall, it's a it's a great film to watch. Absolutely. Definitely during the holidays. Um, definitely make it a point to see it from beginning to end, mm-hmm. and not like and, and like get into it for once. Because like when it first started, and they show like the cosmos, yeah, and like the stars and these planets and like these guys talking, I was just like, wait a minute, yeah, I don't remember this at all. I just remember Jimmy Stewart I, running around like a nut job, right, right. You know, yelling at her, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're in trail. Right. You're so it's present. like, so when you really get into it, and like, it's a, it's a, it's a good, feel good I definitely movie. think we can show it to our son, Tiago. Maybe not in the next year or so, but when he's school aged, I think he would enjoy it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely, I think it's great, especially in the beginning when you have kids being, you know, the main storytellers in the first few scenes that, that could bring in a child's attention. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention. I'm sure you have a backstory on it. Uh, what was up with the crow? Oh, so 
I think it's Jimmy the Crow. Okay. Don't quote me on that. Uh, I can look it up, but eh. apparently he's in every major Capra movie. Okay. That crow has been in every, they didn't say every Capra movie, but every, I guess, Frank Capra presents Mm -hmm, movie. mm -hmm. That's it. Weird. That's it. He just put it in there. Just in there. And he wrote, and then it was so funny because it's like, why is this crow at the business place all the time? And then when they show Uncle Billy at home upset about what he's done, there's like all these random animals. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, he's an animal, animal lover. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say about the production itself was that um, this was Frank Capra and whoever his partners were, their first film like on their own. Right, Liberty Films. Liberty Films. They created, apparently back then directors uh, were just employees of right. movie houses. Right. This is the first company that directors became a company. It's the first badass. DreamWorks. Yeah, right? The first DreamWorks. <laughs> But um, yeah, so it was like their first um, venture out on their own and they had complete creative control. And I think that's probably why the movie is really one of Capra's favorite films. Right. Uh, he's, he himself said it was his favorite film to work on. And we also watched that um, small documentary where he talked about when he was deciding on the film, he was specifically trying not to do like a war film or right. anything. Right, so there's way too many war films. Right. So he wanted something to to capture humanity, the greatness of humanity, and it, and I mean he does like at the end of the movie, even though we've like sort of picked it apart a little bit and sort of poked at it, you know, from our modern standpoint. I mean, at the end of the day, at those last few frames where everybody's giving him money, you're like bawling. Oh yeah, <laughs> he has given his whole life to these people, never expecting anything in return, right. and his right. most time. Of need, everyone shows up. Yeah, everyone shows. Mary goes out and tells people, and every week, everyone's got his back. Yeah, and it's beautiful. And you're beautiful. I'm like hysterical, like crying. I was like, oh my god, they're giving him all the money, and like everybody, the cops, even people who came to like take him away. Yeah, Yeah. the feds that show up and stuff. Yeah, they're all like, all right, they chip in, and and it's. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the sentiment is that we're all in it together. Right. You know? And then his rich buddy comes. Yes. And gives him a lot of money. Right. And they're like, George, you're the richest man in town. <laughs> his rich buddy, that actor, played um, the rich guy in uh, Psycho, you know, my favorite, one right. of my favorite movies ever. And he um, plays like kind of a smarmy, like, you know this older guy that's like buying a house cash for his daughter. Right, He's right. Like so gross about it. So it was funny because in this movie, since I had the memory of seeing him in that movie, I was kind of infusing his character with this like... Hee-haw. Like, yeah. Hee-haw. It was kind of, and it was kind of a little unsettling. But, um, you know, it is... I mean, he was obviously a lot younger, so he in this movie it was filmed before, the, before Psycho, but it was just funny that I had that idea about the character is just like being kind of um a scumbag <laughs> right 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 <laughs> right, he right, right. he was a good guy oh and what about the two his two friends the cop and the Bert and Ernie Bert they were the original Bert and Ernie right that's yeah. so funny yeah, they yeah. were perfect and we can go on about Violet oh she was great walking around town you know oh this oh, not this only wear dress. this one I don't care what I look like and they're Shh. like oh I'm stopping traffic right Right, she so was, good. She was gonna leave town, and she herself doesn't leave town. Right. He to was come giving back and her, he her. was giving her his last dollars. Yeah, yeah. she know? comes back to help him. So yeah, so I mean, the story really is about how one person can make the difference in their community, and how the community can band together to help one. It person. Takes a village. Yeah. Definitely takes a village. Yeah, so it, it was a beautiful film. I would definitely see it again. It can be part of our. Holiday tradition and Christmas tradition right. from now on. That and Elf. And Elf. <laughs> and uh, Polar Express. Polar Express is heavy in the rotation right now. Right now. Uh, which is a good one because it's got another thing with a bell. Yes. Every time you hear he a, bell, a bell, an angel oh, gets he didn't its wings. Talk about the bell. And he's like, he's like, all right, Clarence, good job. <laughs> you know. Every time a bell rings, an angel, an angel gets, gets its, its wings. wings. That's so cute. I know. It's I mean, there's tons of things to always talk about and laugh about right. and cry about with this movie. And that's why it keeps going over and over. And that's why it's so popular. Right. 
And this movie is so popular and so fun that we're adding a little extra thing to this podcast where I have two co-workers of mine um, that love this film. One of them, uh, one of them's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is at the end of this podcast, we're going to tag a couple minute interviews with each nice. of them on what they think about It's a Wonderful Life and their experiences. Oh, great. Yeah. And then like maybe, who knows, you can get like, you know, even more interviews of, of other people. We do it every this year. Every year, you know, just have everyone you know, walk around Main Street. Yeah, and then definitely. Have people talk about it's I a mean, wonderful our life. Our town, I'm sure, a lot of people around here uh, would would find the idea of um, it's a wonderful life and the ta- the small town vibe of it uh, reminiscent of their childhoods here. Yeah, and then we're like the newbies here, but. Um, but it, we're building our own tradition now, so it's it's nice. It's like that's true. it's a full circle. Yeah. So, folks, that's it. Um, we're going to end this portion of the podcast uh, before I jump into the uh, the two interviews coming in after this. But um, until then, um, enjoy the next things you're going to hear. And after this, uh, you can always go to zerodbpodcast.com, and there we have all our social media links. Um, you can send questions and comments to there also. Uh, if you are a Twitter person that tweets and twits <laughs> and all that stuff um at zero db 23 is the twitter handle to go to for that but you can also find us on facebook and uh, instagram and all the social media stuff and also on zero db doc, uh, podcast.com you can also find those links for our pages for facebook and all that so don't forget subscribe on youtube subscribe on apple podcasts we are also on stitcher um and Podomatic. So until next time, folks, um, you know, watch some Christmas movies or yeah. some movies that take place during Christmas. And Always um fun. yeah, and send us comments and uh and questions and things you'd want to talk about too with these Christmas movies. And until then, uh have a great time and happy holidays. Happy holidays, happy new year. Take care, folks. <laughs> to my big brother George. The richest man in town. Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. Had a boy, Clarence.